Hello and welcome to Commodity Culture, where we break down the commodity space for both new and experienced investors. Before we get started, standard disclaimer, nothing here is investing advice. Do your own due diligence. And today's guest helps investors discover lesser known frontier markets, strategic options for second citizenship and residencies and other unique investment opportunities. Mr. Ladislas Maurice, aka The Wandering Investor, welcome to the show. Thank you, Jesse. How are you? I'm doing great. It's awesome to have you here because we normally focus kind of 100% on commodities, but um, I'm very intrigued by by what you do, and, and I really want to dive into it. But before we do that, I want to get started with your background. What got you started investing, and then how did you become known as a wandering investor? Sure. So investing, as soon as I started working, I started saving money and investing on the side. So Taking a step back, so I went to college in Canada, grad school in Australia, started working in corporate uh, for Nestle, the big food company, um, at their headquarters in Switzerland, and then was sent as an expatriate to Africa for seven years. So when you're an expat in countries that are considered dangerous, typically you get danger pay, et cetera, so you can, you can save quite a lot of money. So I did that for a number of years. At the age of 30, so my last role was being on the executive board of Nestle Ghana in charge of the dairy business for a few West African countries. At the age of 30, I thought, cool, I spent most of my 20s in Africa with the same company. Amazing. Now my 30s are starting. I should you know, try something new. So my thought was to move to Dubai and get a job. But first, I wanted to go on a, on a nice trip. So I drove from Oman, so near Dubai, to Paris by car, going through the UAE, all of Iran, Armenia, Georgia, Abkhazia, Turkey, down into Greece, up to Ukraine, and then and then Paris. So it was my first time, and I'm sure a lot of a lot of your audience will understand this. When you work full time. And you're working 50, 60, 70 hours a week, you're, you don't have enough time to prioritize your savings and to prioritize your, your own personal money issues because often you're too busy you know, managing someone else's p And for the first time, I had two things. One, savings and the time to reflect and being in a situation where I saw all of these opportunities as 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 I was traveling, so essentially I started doing flips on the way. Um, I started buying some properties, doing some renovations, and then selling them. And then as I as I did this, I kept pushing back the time at which I would you know try to get a job in Dubai, and that time never came. So I just continued doing deals all over. Um, and after a while, my friends saw on on Facebook when it was still a thing. Hey, Ladislas, um, you're always traveling in all these weird countries. Like, what do you do? Um, so then I started this blog, The Wandering Investor, where I would just lay down my thesis as I as I was traveling and looking at investments. And yeah, it took off. That's great. Now, I saw an interview you recently did with Ferg on Crux Investor, which I really recommend everybody check out. It really resonated with me because I left Canada last year um, to move to Croatia to avoid what I believe was a, a very a government that had a lot of overreach and was extending its power over citizens unnecessarily, in my opinion, and to seek what I think is the most important commodity, which is individual sovereignty and freedom. So how important do you think it is for investors to maintain those things and be outside of the grasp of government intervention and overreach? Look, at the end of the day, it's a, it's a completely personal decision. I mean, you can live in in Canada or in the US and be within the within government overreach and be completely fine with it you know um you know one of the best places to be to live in the in Europe is Switzerland where there is a lot of control you know but you have high salaries you have a high quality of life and sometimes just accepting to to live in the system i mean for the majority of people is the best decision but if what you really want if you personally value this individual sovereignty and freedom, um, then yeah, go for it. But it's going to come at a cost. And generally, that extra cost is complexity. 
because untangling yourself from all of these institutions involves a lot more paperwork and ongoing work, et cetera. So it's, it's really purely a, I think a personal and philosophical decision from an investment point of view, is it better? It's better in the sense that, you know, you can choose to move to places where you end up paying a whole lot less taxes, but that's a whole different topic. That's not necessarily a, a sovereign individual discussion. That's just, you know, moving to a place that is lower tax, but you can still just be fully in that other system. And, you know, some people say, oh, as a sovereign individual, you have more, you can think more freely, et cetera. Sure. It helps me think more freely, freely. Um, but I know many other investors that are much more successful than I am and that are fully in the system and that embrace it. So, you know, it's up to people really. Right. An individual choice. Um, now you invest in what many would consider risky markets. I think you might see it differently because most people consider what they're familiar with to be safe and what's opaque or they can't understand to be risky. So how would you compare investing in a place like that's considered more quote unquote stable like Canada or the US versus places most people might avoid something like Uzbekistan or Turkey? That's a very good question. So I think there's some arbitrage to be done between actual risk and perceived risk. Because, I mean, sure, in many ways, Uzbekistan is riskier than Canada, for sure. But then you want to look at valuations. H how do people actually view it? And they probably view it a lot riskier than it actually is. You know, when I'm buying companies in Uzbekistan for P ratios of four that are growing 20, 30% a year, that are spitting out dividends of 15, 20%, that have almost zero balance sheet, zero debt on their balance sheets. Um, and there are so many favorable things happening in Uzbekistan from a macro point of view. So we're talking, you know, demographics, low debt to GDP, um, a heavy industrial base, a lot of positive reforms. Geopolitically, it's becoming ever more important. I mean, literally, as we are um, filming this, we have Modi, President Xi and President Putin that are all meeting in Samarkand in Uzbekistan. Um, so it just shows the, the growing clout of such little countries. And guess what? Assets are cheap. And then you compare that with Canada and assets are absolutely not cheap. And there is a level of increasing socialism, you know, and we can have a debate of whether socialism is good or bad. You know, again, that's entirely philosophical, but from an investor point of view, generally in socialist environments, your capital is more at risk than in non-socialist environments. Um, Uzbekistan used to be hardcore socialist, and now it's extremely free market, and they've removed all capital controls. They're rolling out the red carpet for people. Is there risk there? Different types of risks, you know? But when I look at the valuations of the two, I feel that people overestimate the risk for Uzbekistan and underestimate the risk for Canada. So it's mostly, I, th I think that's where the, 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 the key friction is. It's what is the level of risk? And then secondly, also, what sorts of risk are you comfortable taking? Um, some countries offer, you know, it could be economic risk. Other countries offer political risk. I mean, we saw with Russia, guess what? It was geopolitical risk. Um, all the numbers I got caught up in Russian stocks, amazing businesses, again, low debt, great dividends, well-managed, et cetera. But hey, geopolitical risk, I got caught up in it. So it's important also to, to know which type of risk you're willing to expose yourself to. That's a great assessment. Now, how does your average investor gain access to a stock market like Uzbekistan? Do, do they have to travel to the country and open a brokerage account? Is there any way to do it online? Or is somebody who's not willing to travel there better served finding some kind of ETF that, that covers that market? 
Cool. So places like Uzbekistan are quite unique in the sense that they're they're not even frontier markets in the sense that they're not there's no ETF, they're not listed anywhere. You you have to like invest in Uzbekistan. So there are no ETFs, nothing like that. So you need to open a brokerage account. It can be done remotely. Um, or also there are always all of these countries, they're always little boutique funds. So there's one run by a friend, AFC Uzbekistan, um, not investment advice. But generally, you need to be, you either go for a fund that will often not be cheap in terms of fees, because, I mean, it is quite obscure, right? And, or you go there yourself or open an account remotely. But then, like, you know, in Africa, it's generally easier in the sense that you can find the information in English. In places like Uzbekistan, like, the companies publish their results in Russian and in Uzbek. So if you're going to be investing there yourself directly, you're going to be very dependent on the broker, uh, which is, you know, not the best of things. So people really need to, you know, that's another level of risk. You invest in a market and you don't really know what's going on. So you buy into a business where the, the fundamentals are great. You get a snapshot. The snapshot's great. But then, you know, you don't really know. You just wait for the broker to you know, hopefully publish an update. Right. And what about financial statements and, and reporting standards? Are they also a little bit more sketchy than, than a place like the US or Canada? For sure. I would trust the auditors. So that's definitely one of the biggest risks in investing in such countries is, you know, do I actually trust the numbers that I see there? Um, and they're prone to making irrational decisions. You know, one, one year they'll give you a 20% dividend. And then the year after they'll be like, oh, no dividend this year because we're expanding our production line. And next year we might. And then the next year they'll give you 10%. You know? So it's the, the, there are markets that are not very developed. These capital markets are not very developed. And you see a lot of what we would tend to view as irrational decision-making by management. So that's another risk that must be highlighted. You made a video on your YouTube channel not too long ago titled "Safe True Safe Havens Do Not Exist Anymore. Could you explain this concept? And if there are no true safe havens for capital in our world today, does being geographically diversified with one one's investments help mitigate overall risk, in your opinion? Yeah, you know, people so often ask me, oh, where's the safest place for me to put my money? You know, where should I move to and move every?" There's no perfectly safe place in this world anymore. That, that's the reality. You know, the Switzerland of this, like Switzerland has joined sanction, sanctions against Russia. So, you know, there will be blowback at some point and they've become more political. Um, you've got all those traditional safe havens in Europe, like Andorra and Liechtenstein and all that. They're, they're oppressed by the EU. They don't have their own real sovereignty anymore. These Caribbean islands are always being pressured by the U.S. and the, the European Union. The, the British Isles are entirely dependent on British foreign policy, which is very aggressive. So depending where you're from, you know, putting your, your funds with the potential enemy, because, um, you know, the U.K. often becomes someone's enemy, is probably not the safest thing to do. Um, and then you've got places like Panama, Mauritius, fine, but they have their own sets of issues, social issues in the country. Um, and then Singapore, where, you know, people say Singapore is really safe. I agree. But if there was a war between China and the US, would the Strait of Malacca not be a target? Um, I, I don't know, like historically, World War II was taken over pretty quickly. And then you've got Dubai. There's no rule of law in Dubai, you know, you've you get into a disagreement with a local and you lose. So there, there's no perfect place. So the only way to, to, to be safer is to be diversified across jurisdictions. Now, the only downside with this approach is that as you're less concentrated, there's always, you're always taking a hit somewhere. Like at any given point, something in my portfolio is blowing up. That's just a fact of life. At any given point, I have some investments that are, going, that are doing horrible. But I always have investments that are doing absolutely amazing. And on balance, 
I'm doing well, but it's not stress-free in the sense that this sort of this sort of methodology requires people to to just accept volatility and and constant essentially risk so nothing that ever happens is fatal to me i'm always free you know but there's i'm always getting hurt somewhere right so there's that that risk that part of your you have to basically have a strong stomach for that sort of thing in some sense if you're going to be worried about some of your investments blowing up but right? I, but i sleep well at night in the sense that i'm diversified i know nothing is fatal you know when do people jump off bridges it's because they were too concentrated in something and it blew up that's when they jump off bridges when you're very well diversified across jurisdictions across asset classes look i mean i took a, a nice hit on russian stocks it wasn't pleasant I wasn't too happy for a few weeks, you know, I got over it, you know, both financially and mentally, uh, you know, and then you move on. So I want to talk a little bit about international real estate, because that's something that you focus on a lot on your channel. I'm completely unversed in real estate, so I'm, I'm a rookie here, but it seems to me like back in Canada and America, the housing market is in a bubble. Are there any countries out there that still have reasonably priced real estate and how do you approach that sector? Are you doing rental properties, commercial real estate, or, or something else? So personally, I do a bit of everything. I do long-term rentals. I do short-term rentals. I do flips. I do developer financing. Um, I can stay in a market very long-term or just for a few years. I'm very flexible because the world changes. And as the world changes, I adapt. I adapt my portfolio. I try to catch inflection points in markets. And and then move on to the next later on. So I think taking a step back, what people need to understand is that in a lot of, in most of the world, the mortgage markets are very weak there because interest rates are high. So the advantage right now of buying in a developing country is that you don't really have interest rate risk. So the the Fed or the Canadian Reserve Bank, like increase central bank increasing interest rates will have a, a supremely negative impact on housing markets in those countries. But you know, in a Colombia where interest rates are already around 10%, you know, going from 10 to 12 won't change a thing because people weren't borrowing. So when you invest in, in those markets, you're actually investing in in true hard assets. And I think this is absolutely important for people to understand. People make the mistake in the West that when they buy real estate, they buy real estate because it's a hard asset. I can touch it. Sure, that's one element of housing. But the other element of housing in Western markets is that it is also a financial asset because of all of the leverage in those markets. But when you buy in a Venezuela right now, in a Colombia, even in a in Mexico or in, like near you where you are in a Montenegro, they are mostly cash markets. So when you buy real estate there, you're buying a real hard asset that is based on market fundamentals more than based on interest rate policies. So what's positive is that in downturns, there's less downside. But when they're, when the money printer go brr, you also have less upside. So that's why it's, it's important to be diversified. I'm not saying, you know, get out of US real estate or get out of Canadian real estate. That's not the message. The message is when you buy real estate in markets that are completely different, that is true, true diversification. And in many cases, the rental yields are very decent and two you can get a residency permit out of it by being an investor in those countries so that's also potentially either from a lifestyle point of view quite interesting could be good for retirement or also a plan b but again important when you're investing in markets that are essentially cash markets there is a lot less liquidity so it's not like america where you put a house in the market and then you have like five bids within a week. That's not going to happen. If you sell something in Montenegro, 
you know, on average, it'll take you six months to a year to sell to sell it. You know, same thing in, in Colombia. It can take quite a few months. Same thing in Mexico. So it's it's a completely different game. Good to know. Um, I do want to touch on commodities because this is commodity culture. I know you've had people like Lobo Tigre on your program to discuss precious metals and uranium, stuff like that. Are there any commodities you're particularly bullish on at, at the moment? And if so, why? Cool. So look, I invest in commodities quite a bit. I have to say I am a lot less qualified to talk commodities than all of the other people that you have on, on your really good show. So again, people, you know, listen to me for real estate and stuff for commodities, take it with a pinch of salt. Look, I'm bullish long-term gold because, you know, how, how can I not be with everything that's going on? Um, at some point, something's going to happen and gold will see a, a revaluation of some, of some sort. Now, I view this as a when moment, not an if moment. It's, it's just a matter of when. But then the biggest risk that I think gold bugs are not discussing is when that happens, what are the guarantees that the gold bugs aren't going to get played by the powers that be? <laughs> and that there are going to be special taxes on physical gold holdings, on uh, gold royalty stocks, et cetera. You know, potentially we're just, you know, helping the industry right now by, by investing, investing and, you know, believing in it. And then when there's the re revaluation, when it happens, we might just get completely screwed over. So people should just be mindful. That there's there's that risk. It's not because you get the revaluation you want that the government is going to cap isn't going to capture the vast majority of it. So that's one risk that we must be aware of. Silver, I like it as a speculation because it's you know gold little erratic cousin. Um, I don't see any supply deficits though. I don't see supply issues. Uh, but what I'm very bullish on and I've been heavily invested in is, is uranium for the last, uh, I started investing in uranium in 2019, uh, just because of the supply story and energy in general, as long as, look, short term, I don't know with everything that's happening, if we go into a very deep recession, uh, the supply issues are not going to matter anymore because there's going to be so much demand destruction. I don't know. Uh, but we're looking at supply issues in in um, in energy. And as long as I don't see Western governments, which are still a massive source of demand, you know, Western countries, as long as I don't see them shifting in terms of ESG, I remain pretty bullish. But then again, the, we as commodity investors are underestimating the the risk of governments actually capturing most of the upside through windfall taxes and the like. Um, right now, windfall taxes are starting to show up. When people start freezing, they'll get raised. Um, so people also need to be very cognizant of this. We're not playing in a fair capitalistic environment. We play in, a, in an environment where, where the, the game is rigged. So... I would not go all in commodities, though I'm I'm very bullish the commodities that I just mentioned. Um, but I I make sure to remain diversified because I know that governments will do something to punish right. us so, for our yeah. success. Yeah, yeah. Are are there any particular countries where governments where you don't have that sort of risk when it comes to the commodities markets? Or are there just certain frontier markets that you see that have attractive opportunities in the commodity space right now? I think all governments are going to go for it. I don't trust any government. But the question is, which stocks have that kind of priced in versus others that don't? Um, when I look at, you know, American energy stocks, European energy stocks, they're, they're not that, that cheap. Um, compared to a Petrobras in in Brazil that's already pricing in a communist coming to power. It's priced in. Um, you know, same thing in Africa. It's just, you know, everything's priced in. Um, so when bad things happen, I, I, I feel, because ultimately it's just a feeling, um, that there will potentially be less 
downside risk on those shares than on Western ones once the windfall taxes actually show up. So we started off the conversation talking about individual sovereignty, personal freedom, and I like how you discuss that as a philosophy. It's not a one-size-fits-all. But for those of us who do not want to live under, say, more and more increasingly authoritarian governments, this seems to be happening in the West these days. You know, there's talk of things like central bank digital currencies, carbon footprint tracking, and it seems like a lot of those governments just want more and more control over their citizens. So do you, do you have any countries uh, in, in mind when I mention that, that maybe the governments won't be playing these games with, these, with their citizens and where the, there'll be more individual freedom moving forward? I think all governments inherently want to play these games with their citizens. There is this delusion in a lot of Western circles that, oh, the West is evil. You know, we can we should move east. I mean, all of these things that you mentioned, they're happening in the east as well, um, all over Asia, Eurasia, etc. It's happening worldwide. So I think it's not about which governments won't try to do this. It's rather about which governments won't be able to. <laughs> So if you want true freedom, you're going to have to go to some countries in in the Balkans where governments are just generally fairly incompetent. Um, you're going to have to go to Latin America where also governments are pretty incompetent. And in some countries where cartels run the show and cartels don't really care about that sort of control, they just want to work on business. Um, and Africa where the governments are way too inept to put these things into place. So... I inherently don't trust government because if you give a politician anywhere, they're the same people everywhere, politicians. You know, I've traveled everywhere. I've met people all over the world. Politicians are, are a single breed of people everywhere. And if there are tools for them to have more control, and, I, and it doesn't necessarily mean that, I don't mean that they're all evil. All politicians are evil. You know, a big chunk of them actually want to use that control to, to do good for their countries. But inherently, that's not how it works out in the end. Um, so you want to go, if, if you truly care about freedom, like real freedom with the risks that freedom entails, then you go to very undeveloped countries with incompetent governments. And you will have your true freedom, but then criminals around you will be free as well. So you'll have to deal with that. You'll have to deal with a different type of risk. Do you I love that. Dealing, do you prefer to deal with a 20 year old Colombian guy putting a gun to your face, or do you prefer a Western government, you know, putting, you know, something else in your body and, you know, taking 50% of your income um, or, you know, being in Colombia or being in Paraguay and paying zero. Um, so it's, again, it's entirely a, a personal decision it also depends on you know which stage of life you're at um do you have kids are you retired and old maybe you know maybe the infrastructure in paraguay isn't that good for you um you know if you're young male you know probably paraguay is better so it just depends really there's no perfect answer right there's always trade-offs and different types of risks so i really appreciate that answer Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, for people who want to learn more about The Wandering Investor and what it is you do, where should they go? I absolutely recommend people sign up to my private list. It's free, thewanderinginvestor.com slash private list, and then they'll get email updates once a week or so. I actually don't, don't spam on all my invest uh, investment updates and immigration updates. Also, I talk about second residencies, passports, as I travel around the world full time. Commodity Culture is a series on commodities and natural resources. If you would like to see more, be sure to subscribe and hit the bell notification so you're always up to date with the latest episodes.